In Genesis chapter 26, there's a lot of stuff, there's a long chapter, but what we're focusing on is that section of the story that kind of begins in, in verse 13. Because here we see Abraham's already passed on, and, and now we see Isaac, and, and this story kind of covers a lot about Isaac, and it says in verse 13, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So it's talking about, you know, he's, he's basically becoming great as in getting riches. He's, he's accumulating wealth. God is blessing him. He's, you know, his, his cattle, all, all of his property, he's just, he's just amassing more wealth. He's gaining more servants. He's, you know, he, he's becoming very successful. It, and, um, and it's because God has been blessing him. And it says in verse 14, it says, For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. So he's, he's sojourning here in this land, it says, because there was a famine in the land in verse number 1 in chapter 26. So he's, he was escaping a famine, right? Where he was living, he's, there, was, there was just a dearth, you know, there was a famine, um, there was a lack of food, so, so he, he decided to move over, and he went into the land of the Philistines, and... Um, of course, all of this is going on. Remember, Isaac, this is before God has given him that promise. I mean, this is before Moses. This is before them going in and destroying all the nations. God had just promised Abraham all this land. So he's just sojourning in this land. He goes in there, but the Philistines that were the, the, the people of the land at that time, they looked at him and they envied him. They saw what he had and, and they wanted it. I mean, they, they were looking at him. And, um, you know, obviously, when people are successful, oftentimes that's what happens. People look up to him and they, and they just envy and they want what, what he has and what God has blessed him with. But um, that's not what I'm preaching about this morning. We look at verse 15. It says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham and called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Now, the title of my sermon this morning is Digging the Old Wells. Okay? We're going to be looking at this story and kind of getting into what, you know, the symbolic meaning of this. And there's a few other places in Scripture we're going to go to, but... Um, we see here that, you know, wells, especially back then, were extremely, wells even today, they're extremely important. You know, a water source, right? Think about your, you know, if you have, for one, it needs, it's going to provide water for yourself. We all need water to survive, right? You're living in the wilderness, you live about anywhere. Anywhere you live, you're going to need some kind of water. And the way you get that water, mostly, unless you live by a body of water, you're going to have to dig a well in order, in order to, um, to get that. And... It's also not just for yourself, it's for your animals, for crops, whatever. I mean, if you, need, if you need to do some irrigation, you want to feed your animals. And, you know, with Isaac, the more, the more uh, cattle you, you accumulate, the more, the more things you have, the more servants you have, hey, the more water you're going to need. These wells become very important, very valuable. That's why you see throughout the Bible here, especially in the book of Genesis, you see people fighting over wells. You know, they're fighting about it like, like we dug this well, but because, you know, I mean, it's not like you're, you're setting up camp and just, just like owning that well. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you dig it, it's there. You're, you're feeding your cattle are going all over the place. They're free grazing. And um, you come back to that well, and when there's other people around in the land, you know, they're going to start using it. And, and what's happening is people are having a dispute over ownership of these things. And um, it, they're a valuable resource. I mean, water is a very valuable resource. And um, so what they had done, they, they, you know, Abraham was becoming great, and, and he accumulated a lot, right? And um, the king of Gerar, he, um, which is um, Abimelech, Abimelech was the king of Gerar, he, um, he made a treaty with Abraham when he was alive. Because he saw that God was blessing him, he saw it was becoming more mighty and powerful, and he didn't want Abraham. But basically, this is like, what's happening with Isaac is a repeat of what happened with Abraham. Abraham went through the exact same thing, even down to the wife, right? I mean, Abraham went into this land, and Abraham feared that they were going to kill him for his wife, so he said, she's my sister. And, um, you know, the, a God appeared unto Abimelech in a dream and said, don't touch this, you know, don't touch Sarah for, you know, for she's Abraham's wife. And that whole thing happened. And then um, 
Abimelech basically wanted Abraham to leave because he was becoming so great and mighty. And even in Abraham's day, they were striving and fighting over these wells. And um, back in an earlier chapter, you know, at Beersheba, Abraham goes, you know, Abimelech's trying to make this treaty with them, and Abraham brings up, hey, you know, then why are your guys, you know, violently taking away my wells from me? And Abimelech was like, oh, I didn't even know that was going on, you know. And there's this whole thing where they establish it, and, and Abraham set, makes, uh, sets aside some ramps and slams, I think, to, to sacrifice, and says that, you know, basically they settle it, and they say, okay, you know, I'll make an agreement with you. We'll, we'll be in a league together. We're not, you know, I'm not going to come and attack you. You're not going to come and attack me. We'll be at, live at peace with each other. And we've established that this well belongs to me. So while Abraham was alive, they didn't go and mess with any of his stuff. They didn't go and mess with his wells. But after he died, they did. I mean, the Philistines went, and that's where it says they went in, um, in verse, 20, or verse 18 of chapter 26. It says, And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged, in the days of Abraham, his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. So after Abraham dies, they're just like, we're stopping these wells up. And um, Isaac decides, you know what? No, I'm going to go out and redig those wells. Now, um, <clears throat> what I want to... Sorry. Isaac redigging those wells is, is very symbolic. Right? Obviously, it's important for him. It's important for the water source. You know, that water source represents life. Um, Jesus is often refer, you know, referred to as being, you know, uh, salvation coming, just taking a drink of water. And, and the waters of life flowing out of your belly and, and things like that. And, you know, water itself can have that symbolism. And this well is a source for life. And, and you could look at this um, with, with digging wells. First of all, with digging wells, a lot of work involved. Right, I mean, think about the amount of work that's involved in digging well. Uh, Brother Jerry and I were just digging a, a hole in the ground out here that was not very deep at all. I mean, it was, it was what, what did we get, maybe two feet deep, if that, not even, I mean, a foot and a half. And, um, and that, was, that was some hard work. I'll tell you what, I mean, it was, that was getting through the rock and getting through the clay and everything else. Just, just getting through that little bit. Digging a well is a lot of hard work. Get, digging down deep enough to find water is it, it's it's definitely a lot of work and um we first of all we can't be afraid of the hard work right if someone goes and stops up that well you need to get back out there and do it again but um more importantly than that though i, I like what, what isaac did here it says at the end of verse 18 it says and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them he's restoring what was already done before him that was done righteously. And, and this is kind of where the sermon's going, basically, is, you know, we need to redig the old wells of, of the right way of doing things, of, of biblical living, of, of getting right with God. Because what's happened these days is that there have been people who have come and stopped up those wells. The, you know, the following God's word, the way that, that it's written, the way that it's laid out for us, people have come along and, and they've, they've been negligent, they haven't kept up with it, and um, and by and large, a lot of the you know the enemy has come and, and has come and filled those wells, and we need to get back to the old ways. We need to get back to 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 doing that hard work first of all, and that's why see one of the reasons why people don't like it like doing living the Christian life and obeying God's commandments is because it can be hard work. I mean, you have to go out and and yeah, you might sweat. Yeah, you you know you go out and talk to people. You know, you invest time studying and reading the Bible and praying and doing all these different things that we're supposed to do. It, it could be hard work. It's going to take away from your fun time. But it's important. It's necessary. Like here, these, these wells brought life, right? If we're going to live the Christian life, we're going to go out and, 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 bring, and you know, get souls saved. We need to bring life to them in a way. You know, we need to be digging that well and, and bringing that water to people. To, and, and in order to do that, see... In order to be able to bring that life to people, bring that life, you need to dig down deep into this book. You need to get that work done first before you can bring that water to anyone else. You need to, to, to study down here and, and get founded in God's Word. Dig down here, know the Bible. Um, obviously, bring what you can. I'm not saying don't go soul winning until you know the Bible completely because then no one will ever go because you don't know the Bible completely. What I'm saying is, 
you know, bring what you can, but you need to keep on going back and dig deeper and dig deeper to produce, to get more of that water to bring out um, and to bring that life unto more people. But, um, you know, digging a well is hard work. And another point I want to point out here is that, you know, Isaac was unable to rely on the work that his father had done. Right? He had to go out and redig these wells. He had to go out and do the same work. And we can't today, as people, rely on what other people are doing. For example, um, you know, this didn't happen this way, but maybe, maybe you grew up in a family, right? And, and you hear this out so long, too. I hear this all the time. You know, your dad is a preacher, or someone else in your family is a pastor of a church, or, or you know, whatever. You can't rely on what they're doing. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, and, and I hear, you know, I'll ask someone, hey, if you're a guy, dad, you know for sure you're going to heaven. They're like, oh, well, my dad's a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, well, I'm asking you. Okay, I'm not talking to your dad. I'm asking you. You know, just because your dad's a pastor doesn't guarantee you a ticket into heaven, right? Yeah. I want to know what you believe. But, and that's, and that's a perfect example of people just relying on someone else. You know, it's like, hey, he's doing this work and I'm relying on that. Um, you can't rely on, on previous generations. You can't rely on, on any of the work that they've done. Now, any work that's been done for us, praise God for that, you know, to maybe make your job a little bit easier, but that doesn't mean that you can just sit back and relax. I mean, that's, what, that's what's going on, too. You see all these kids, um, you know, their, their parents grow up wealthy, or not grow up wealthy, but earn. They earn a, 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 amass a lot of wealth by earning it and working for it and really putting in the effort and putting in the hard work. And then the kids grow up spoiled, not having to work for anything, and oftentimes those fortunes are just wasted. Mm -hmm. they're, just, they're, just, they're just here today, gone tomorrow. Because they didn't learn how to work. Because everybody has to do their own work. Everyone's going to be responsible for doing their own work. Hey, if you have a head start in life, amen, praise God for that, that's good. But you still need to go out and do work. You need to be individually responsible to going out and doing that hard work. You can't just relax and rely on the fact that someone else has done this stuff for you. Isaac couldn't do that, right? Hey, he had a great opportunity. His father Abraham had gone and he dug all these wells and did all this work. Well, guess what? Abraham or Isaac couldn't rely on that work. He had to go out and dig wells. He had to go out and do this hard work as well. And he also became successful, right? Um, you can't rely on the work of anybody else. It all is going to boil down to yourself. You have to take personal work. Hey, maybe you go to a great church, or to a soul-winning church where a lot of people are going out there and bringing the gospel of Christ. You can't just, you just say, oh, well, I'm doing right because I'm in a church where other people are going out soul winning. No, you need to take that responsibility on yourself. You need to get in. You need to do the work. You need to help dig those wells. And um, what we need to do today is focus on, on going back to those old paths. And the, see, the thing is, there's always going to be someone who's going to be out there trying to stop that work. There's always going to be the Philistines going back and filling up those wells, which is one of the reasons why there's always work to do. Right? There's all these well, these wells, so to speak, are always going to have to be redug and redug and redug because the enemy is going to be out there working against you, trying to fill them up, trying to stop them. The enemy is going to be out there trying to get you to stop soloing, trying to get you to stop reading your Bible, get you to, to, to compromise on your beliefs, trying to get you to, to, to get away from following God as closely as the Bible says that we ought to, and as closely to what the Bible says. So, you know, you are going to be getting this, this adversity all the time. So you can never sit back, all you can is never sit back and relax with where you're at. Say, you know... Uh, and, and this happens a lot too. You all know, see it where people will grow, and, and you know you get saved, and and how, you know a certain amount of time goes by, and you start growing, and you start growing, and you're like, man, I'm learning a lot. I go out soul winning, and then you kind of feel like you put in enough work, and then people start to coast. And the problem with that is when you start to coast, you feel like, hey, I've done enough. I'm I'm doing good. I'm I'm I am doing good. I'm going to take it easy for a while. Well, guess what? That's when you start going backwards. That's when the backsliding starts. When, when you think that, that there's not more work that needs to be done, when you, when you, when you just, just hold back and say, okay, I've, I've, I've arrived. You know, I read the Bible for 10 minutes a day. I pray for 20 minutes a day. And I you know, go out soul winning once a week for an hour. So that's good. 
and like you set these these standards for yourself and just say check 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 okay I'm good no that's not the way it works when you when you get to that point I'll warn you because first of all where are you coming up with these standards God never says anywhere you have to read the Bible for this amount of time he never says you have to go out and, and so on for this amount of time and he never says um, you know puts those limits on it but it's very clear and obvious from the Bible he wants you to do it as much as possible I mean he says Pray without ceasing. Okay, pray without ceasing doesn't mean five minutes a day. Or it doesn't mean once before you eat. I mean, he's saying pray without ceasing. And if you look at all of his commandments, this like, I mean, it's, it's like unattainable. The amount of work that he wants us to do. I mean, the amount of time that we should be meditating on his word. We need to be studying, meditating, reading, witnessing, you know, praying, doing all these different things, getting sin out of your life, right? I mean, he says, be ye holy for I am holy. His level of standard is, look, God is holy. God is perfect. God has no sin whatsoever. And he wants us to be holy. That is, a, that is a huge task. And that's why I'm saying, you know, never let yourself get into this mentality. And that's what it is. It's just, it's just this mindset, this mentality of thinking, I'm doing okay now. Yeah. I'm good. You know, I don't need to work harder. There's always work to be done. Because like I said, the enemy's always working against us. So every time, I mean, you're out there digging, you're out there doing work, and you can look and be like, man, I've accomplished a lot. And maybe, yeah, amen, great. You know, keep moving forward, though, because all that work you're doing, someone else is going to be coming and trying to backfill everything you've just, been, you've just been working on. And it could be work that you've done five years ago, ten years ago, but, hey, man, you got, you got to keep working and working harder than the enemy does to, to make that progress. But the work, the work constantly has to be done. Now turn, if you would, to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58, because there's these three, these three passages we're going to turn to this morning. Genesis 26, Isaiah 58, and Jeremiah 6. We need to get back to the old paths. We need to dig the old wells. Okay? We need, we need to, to redo the work, a lot of the work that's been done before us. Now, in this country especially... There has been a lot of great Christians in this country. There have been a lot of people that have been living godly. And if you look at the way that our laws used to be, is a reflection, a much, a much better reflection of God's laws in the Bible. But as time has gone on, as people have gotten more wicked and more wicked, you know, they've changed the laws of change. I mean, you have things like adultery and sodomy and all these, you know, all these other sins. That, that are deserving of the death penalty according to the Bible, kidnapping, you know. And in the early days of this country, they were the death penalty. That, that was the law of the land. It, it reflected the Bible. And that was a much more righteous way of living. And we need to get back to that. We've gone, we've strayed very far from the old paths. And you know what, I'm talking about the early days of this country, but it goes way before that. We need to go even older than that. We need to go back to God's word. This is the old way. This is the old path that we need to file to follow. God's word has been in existence forever. He's, you know, he 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 had his word. God's word has been in existence eternally. He's revealed it to us in various times. But this is the old way. This is the old path, and this is the right way. Isaiah fifty-eight. Look at verse number one. Because this is the old way. This, this describes the old-fashioned the old fashioned way of preaching. Isaiah 58, verse number 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. God lays out for us in the Bible a type, the, the way that preachers and the way that church ought to be. If you're going to a church where the preacher's not crying aloud, where the preacher spares, you know, he's holding back, and, and he's not lifting up his voice like a trumpet and showing God's people their transgression, and now to Jacob their sins, look, one of the jobs of the preacher is to show people their sins. Why? Is it just to make them feel bad, and just, and just to, to make them feel bad for the rest of the week? No, of course not. That's not the goal at all. The goal is to, hey, be holy for I am holy. The goal is, hey, I didn't realize I was doing wrong. I didn't realize that I was committing sin. I'm going to get this sin out of my life so that I can be right with God. Yeah. So it would be a good job. And 
God says that this is the way that you need to do that. There's many different approaches that you can take, and there's a lot of churches out there today that, that, that use different approaches. No, you know, they might sit down and be just Mr. Friendly and just talk real quiet and say, well, you know, the Bible says it talks about alcohol and it says it's a sin. And, um, you yeah, know, it's probably not the best thing you should do. It's, uh, it's, yeah. just, it's not a good idea. Yeah. You know, God says it's wrong, so. Is that the way the Bible says it? No. The Bible says, cry, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up that voice like, hey, it's wickedness. Hey, this is going to get you in a lot of trouble. Hey, you're going to be looking on women. You're going to have pervert, perverted thoughts. You touch that alcohol, it's going to affect your brain. It's going to affect your decision making. It's going to ruin your life. That's the type of preaching we need today. Because that's what gets, gets through to people. This is what we need to hear. We need to know what our treasures are. Hey, these are the old ways. This is the old path. This is the path that we need to follow. This is what God has intended for us to do. Look at verse number two. It says, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They asked of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So now he's talking about a people here. He says, but they, they, see, they seek me daily. You know, he's, he's telling verse one, hey, cry aloud, spare not. You know, show them their transgressions, right? Show them their sins. He says, but these, these people, they seek me daily. They delight to know my names as a nation, as a nation. They're like, in their eyes, they think they're righteous. In their eyes, they're not afraid to go to God. They're thinking, hey, we're doing great. They're thinking, hey, everything's just fine. It says, as, you know, as if they were people that forsook not the ordinance of their God, which they did forsake the ordinance of their God, but they're going to God as if, hey, everything's just fine. This is the Christian today. This is, this is the person that, that, that they go to church every week, mm -hmm. right? And they think everything is just fine, yet they're going out and committing all kinds of sins and not living according to the way the Bible says because they're being deceived because they're maybe sitting under a preacher and saying, well, it's not that bad. It's okay. Hey, we're living under grace. Mm -hmm. That's the Old Testament. That's the old law. We don't need to worry about that stuff anymore. That's not for us today. You know, you're okay. You're just fine. Keep on, you know, filling your mind with, with the Hollywood garbage. Keep on drinking your beer, you know, in moderation, <laughs> what they'll say. You know, keep on doing this stuff. And look, God gets angry. God gets wrathful when people just, you know, you could read his word and you think you're doing fine and you're going to church and you don't even realize how sinful your life actually is <laughs> because you just think everything's just fine. And again, that's another reason why you need this type of preaching to expose it, to just say, hey, look, this is wrong. And it needs to hit home with you because, because you need to make a change in your life. You need to repent to get right with God. Verse number three says, Wherefore have, they fa have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. So now they're asking these questions, right? They're approaching unto God. They think everything's great. I'm going to church. And now they're asking God, hey, why have we fasted and you don't even see it? Like, how come you're not listening to us, God? Hey, we're doing everything, right? We're fasting. This is how they see themselves in their own eyes. He says, wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Like, you don't even know we're doing this. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. See, they don't understand why God isn't hearing them. But God's going to explain it to them right here in verse number 4. It says, uh, behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. So he's laying it out to him right now. He's saying, look, when you're fasting, because you think about fasting, right? What is fasting? Fasting is when you're withholding food from yourself. And, and usually in the Bible, the reason why people fast, the whole purpose of it, is because it's, it's mixed with praying. They're praying unto God. They really have a great need. So when, when David's son was, was stricken and was about to die, the one that he had with Bathsheba, and, that God was judging him for, right? That, that, that God was taking away that... that um, his, child, his son's life because he committed that sin and he had um, Uriah the Hittite killed in battle be, to cover up the wickedness of his adultery, right? So, but when David was praying for the child, he was fasting, he wasn't eating, he was mourning, he was in sackcloth and ashes and he was praying to God because he's trying to, to, to really like get God's attention. So when you fast, when you afflict your soul by withholding stuff from yourself, say, you know what, I'm going to go through some sort of, a, of, of like a 
you know, of, of affliction here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself not eat. I'm going to go through this hunger. I'm going to go through this experience. And I'm going to be praying to God and say, God, you know, look, look, I'm really trying to get a hold of you. I really want you to answer my prayers. Right? That's why, I mean, that's generally why people fast in the Bible. And it's a good thing to do. I encourage you to do that, especially when you have something really important in your life, something really major deal going on in your life. Hey, fast. And pray to God. This is, this is a, a legitimate way to, to have God, you know, to, to try to get God to, to, to listen to you. And, um, but it's going to do you no good, first of all, if your prayers are, are wrong, if you're, if you're, if you're asking for, for the wrong thing, and if you're just living a life of wickedness. Right? I mean, if you're just totally in sin, hey, God's not going to hear your prayers. It doesn't matter if you fast. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, look, you fast for strife and debate, for fighting. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's nothing godly at all. You're fasting and you're asking for things just for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. They're praying for all the wrong things. And I'm sure they don't see it that way. But God's telling them, no, look, this is wicked. The things that you're asking for and what you're fasting for, and you're thinking, and you're coming to me saying, why aren't you hearing us? Say, so you're praying for the wrong things. You're wicked. You're, you fast for strife and for debate. He says, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? So now he's asking, God's asking him, look, is this the type of fast that I've, that I've chosen, the one that I've picked out, the one that I told you to, to, to do? He says, um, a day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast? And an acceptable day to the Lord. He's saying, you call this a fast? You call this acceptable unto me? You're not doing anything the way that, the way that I'm telling you to do it. You're not following the old ways. You're not following the old paths. You're doing everything the way that you ought to do them. Whatever feels good unto you. See, this is God's way. He's going to explain what his way is in verse number 6. This is the way. This is the way to dig that well. This is the way that we need to go. Look at verse number 6. It says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. Get rid of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free in that ye break every yoke. You say, look, you don't bring people into bondage. You're trying to free people from bondage. You're trying to do good. You're trying to do right. You don't fast for strife and for debate and for the fist of wickedness. You need to, to let the oppressed go free Verse number seven, it says, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, to help people, feed, you know, help feed those in need, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Or your own family. Look, don't hide yourself. Look, you, especially your family, your family's in need. You help them out. You don't hide yourself from them, from your own flesh. And he says, look, you see someone naked? Hey, you cover that person. You don't go out, this is why you fast. This is what you come to me with. This is what you need help doing. These are the things that you need to be going out and doing and making sure that you're doing that which is right. These are the old ways. This is the way God has, has taught us what, what he's taught us to go out and do. Um, not the other things that they were asking for here for the strive for the debate. Verse number eight says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward. Now, he's explaining, look, if you do these things, then your light is going to break forth as the morning. Hey, then you're going to shine. Then you're going to be blessed. Then you're going to have um, your health shall spring forth speedily. Verse number nine says, then shalt thou call and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. Look, if you're doing the things that God said, hey, if you're helping the hungry, if you're helping the few, if you're helping to clothe people that are naked, if you're bringing people in your house, if you're doing the things that God has told you to do, if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, right? He says, hey, that I'll hear you. That I'll answer. Don't think that you can just live in wickedness and then when something bad happens to you, you're going to fast and pray unto God and God's just going to hear you. You don't think you're just going to get a hold of God that way when everything's wrong in your life because you've just been decided not to, to live a way that God told you to live. He's saying, no, do these things. 
do what I tell you to do, and then, and then hey, when you're in trouble, call upon me. I'm going to hear you. I'll help you out. I'll hear what's going on in your life. I see what you're, you're, you're out there doing good. You're out there helping people. You have a problem? Call on me. I'll answer. I'll say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, verse number 10 says, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And I love that, that, that phrase there at verse number 10, and if thou draw out thy soul. It's the same reference to a well, right? What do you do with a well? You draw out the water. When you go to a well, you, you draw you draw water, you draw water from the well, you pull it out of that of that of that deep place, right? You you you, you lower the, the bucket down deep to draw that water out. He say, look, if you draw out thy soul to the hungry, if you pour out your soul to the hungry, you you spend yourself for them, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in this obscurity and thy darkness be as you said, look, your darkness. It's going to be like broad daylight, right? Which obviously isn't dark at all. He's saying, look, you won't have that darkness in you. You'll, you'll be as the noonday. Your light shall rise. You're going to shine in obscurity in a dark place. You're going, to, you're going to shine forth. Verse number 11 says, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. That's a great comfort. Look, if you start doing these things that, that, he, that he tells us to, um, he says, God's going to guide you continually. God's going to direct your path. And satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. See, this is the way to dig a well with waters that aren't going to fail, right? Doing, doing these good things and, and, and getting God to listen to you. Uh, verse number 12 says, And then they that shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. This is the way to do it. Then this is what we need to do today. There's, this is not going on. We need to, to be a restorer of paths. We need to go and repair the breach. There's been a breach broken through in Christianity. There's a breach that's broken through. The enemy has stopped the wells. The breach has happened, okay? People aren't recognizing God's word and living the way that it says that we ought to live in the pages of this book. People come soft to sin. They think it's not that big of a deal. And again, it's reflected in our justice system, our lack thereof, a lack of justice system, where, where, where you know, people commit crimes, they get a slap on the wrist, it's not that big of a deal. There's not the proper hatred of sin, that we need to get this out of our lives and recognize it for what it is instead of just satisfying your flesh and gratifying your flesh and, and you know, doing whatever it is that, that feels good to you. It says um, in verse number 13, it says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So he's saying in verse 13, look, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, so he's saying, look, Taking that day of rest, if you're delighted in that, if you're delighted in obeying God's commandments, if you're delighted in going to church, delighted in doing the things of God, the holy of the Lord, honorable, it says, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, right? Honoring God by doing things the way that God has laid out, not the way that you want to do them. Putting yourself aside, saying, you know what? I want to do this and this and this. I want to go out. I want to have fun. I want to do... Whatever it is, and again, you know, I'm not saying you can never have fun, right? But people live their whole lives, and that's all it's about is having fun. They work to buy toys to go out and play. And my friends, that's not what life is all about. Not at all. It's hard work. And, and we need to work. Look, our life is but a vapor. We're here for a short period of time. We need to work 
hard. There are a lot of people dying and going to hell. There, are, there is a world full of people dying and going to hell. We need to make sure we're doing as much work as possible. Take delight in the things of God. Make that, you know, a source of joy for you. And when you, when you like doing the things of God, when you like reading the Bible, hey, you're going to do it a lot more. When, when, you, when you can enjoy these things, then you start getting the right view of um, what a lot of things maybe in the past you had previously gotten joy from. When, when the more you, you love God and love the Bible, you start realizing, wow, that actually isn't that fun anymore. You, know, it's, it's, you start, when you gain that knowledge, do it, <laughs> committing sin just isn't as fun anymore. It's just, it's just not the same. Um, it's hard to describe, I guess, in words, but it's just, um, you know, like, like now, I guess previously, I used to be able to go out to a bar or whatever and, and have some drinks and think I'm having a great time. If I were to go out and try to do that now, it would not be fun at all. It would be so opposite of having a good time. I, like, I couldn't imagine. I'd just be thinking about, like, man, God's going to come down and rain fire and brimstone on me if I, if I were to go out and do that now. And he would. And he would. I mean, being, being a son of God and being in a position that I'm in and going out and, 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 just, and just willfully sinning against God, he absolutely would, would chasten me and scourge me. And... And honestly, even if I wasn't thinking about that, it still wouldn't be fun because, because of the wisdom gained of, of, of that really is just going to ruin my life. Mm -hmm. Even without God's chastisement at all, going out and committing these sins is just going to ruin your life. It's not going to produce anything good. You think you're having fun for a moment, right? Being in some altered state of consciousness. But all that's going to do is bring misery to your life. Mm -hmm. And it's foolishness. I mean, a fool just takes delight in having their mind feel funny and, and having things look a little bit different mm -hmm. and, and having some false sense of courage to, to, to say some things or to approach somebody or whatever. And if you need alcohol to do any of those things, you're a coward. Yeah, it's good. You're a coward. If you need alcohol to go out and speak to somebody, you need alcohol to go out and, and do anything huh. at all. You're a coward. Good. Get some strength on your own. Don't rely on, on some other substance to give you that strength. Don't rely on that substance for anything. It's going to bring misery. It's going to bring. It's going to break up your family. It's going to. It's going to break up your body. It's a poison, and that's just one example. Um, there's so many others. When when you start to see sin for what it really is, when you see past the illusion that Satan is cast on sin. Whether it be fornication, adultery, you know, any any of this wickedness, sorcery, I mean, whatever, whatever it is, idolatry, he puts this 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 image, a facade behind it. He's like he's like the you know the devil's like the the Wizard of Oz, right? Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. He's this, and and people are going to be, you know, I believe Satan is going to be like this like this little mm -hmm. creature that's mm -hmm. like, you know. Because people, the Bible even says that when people are going to see him, when he's cast into hell, it's going to be like, you? Like, you're the one behind this? You're the one responsible for all this? Yeah. And Because he brings up this great image. And he's a master of deception and illusion. He'll make, that's why the billboards out there, you know, show people, drink, you know, for cigarettes, it'll be like people playing volleyball on the beach. Right, I mean, this really young, energetic, you know, doing doing these activities that have nothing to do with smoking or drinking or or whatever they're trying to sell you on. But it's it. It's it's a lie. It's an illusion. They're trying to make you think, oh, hey, look, this is good. This is fun. You know, look at those people and, and associate, you know, having a good time yeah. with whatever the, with with sin. Mm -hmm. And that's what Satan's good at. And and he continues to do that. But when you can see past that, when you read the Bible, when you can see these things. You understand, you gain that wisdom from God that says, it's, it's, it's an illusion, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. This is not going to do me any good. Hey, don't get fooled by that lie. Um, and I don't even remember how I got off on this tangent, but um, we need to get back to the old ways and the old past. Turn if you go to Jeremiah 6, the last place we're going to turn. Because you see, when God's ways are forsaken, wickedness abounds. We saw the people in Isaiah 58 where we, just, where we just read. They were definitely religious. They were going to church. They were going to God. They were fasting, right? 
They were doing these things. But, and they thought they were even doing good. But they weren't. They had forsaken the old ways. They had forsaken what God had just simply told them to do. And you think about the things that we read. I mean, you know, feeding, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, doing all these things, which is exactly what Jesus Christ even said too. You know, um, when he said, you saw me, you know, or you, you didn't come and visit me in jail, you know, when people were cast out, and, and, I, and I'm not quoting it right at all, but he's basically going through the same list. Hey, I was hungry and you didn't feed me, right? I was naked and you didn't clothe me. And, and he said, in as much as you didn't do it unto the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. It's the same list. I mean, it's, it's, it's not very difficult stuff. It's, it's not very complicated things to do. He's just saying, look, do good to others. Put, your, put other people in front of you. Don't lift yourself up. Don't be worried about, about how much you know, wealth or how many things you can amass for yourself in this life. Put other people in front of you and think about them and try to help them out. Those that need especially. That's the example that Christ put forth for us. Those are the ways that we need to follow. It says, um, look at Jeremiah chapter 6. Because these people here became very wicked. And, and judgment was coming and they were being warned about it. And again, that's what, that's what the Bible does for us. The Bible warns us of judgment to come. God's word. God warns us. He doesn't want us to have to go through this judgment. He doesn't want us to have to reap the, 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 the evil from the things that you sow. When you, when you sow bad, he doesn't want you to have to reap it. So, so he tries to, to cut it off in the past and say, don't even sow wickedness. Don't even do this stuff. Sow that which is good so you can reap that which is good. And, and he tries to cut it off. The Bible is full of warnings and that's what the preacher's job, one of the biggest jobs a preacher can do is to warn people. And that's what it's on Isaiah 51. He says, look, cry aloud, spare not. War, you have to warn the people about the sin so they don't get caught up in it. So they don't go down this path and then they have to reap the consequences. In Jeremiah 6, we saw people who, they were committing wickedness. Judgment was coming and they didn't even want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the truth. And they were told to ask and to seek the old paths where is the good way, but they wouldn't do it. They didn't want to do it. Look at verse number 6 of Jeremiah 6. It says, For thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast them out against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. So he's saying, look, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, at this time he's saying, they're holy oppression. What is oppression? You're, you're oppressing people. You're, you're bringing them into bondage, right? You're doing wickedness on the people. You're doing evil on the people. You're oppressing them. You're, you're, you're you know, making them your slaves or whatever. You're, you're, you're putting them down, right? You're oppressing them. He says the city is just holy oppression. Verse number 7 says, As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Now that's a good analogy. You're saying, look, you think about a, a fountain that's just spraying up and just spraying water everywhere, right? He's saying that's how um, Jerusalem was with her wickedness. There's just, I mean, it's just, it's just a fountain spraying wickedness everywhere. Just the, the, the source of, the, of, the, of that city was just, was just spewing out wickedness all over it. That is, that is not a good place to be. Um, it says, Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. Verse number 8 says, Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. Look, be instructed. Listen to my words. Listen to God's words. He says, or else... You're going to be desolate. You will, I'm going to wipe you out, is what he's saying. Isn't it? That's exactly what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. He wiped them out. That was wickedness going on in Sodom and Gomorrah continually. And how did God re react to that? I mean, he, he had a chance for, they had a chance for instruction, and they didn't want anything to do with it. And God made that a land not inhabited. He wiped them out. He rained fire and brimstone down and just decided to wipe out that, that wickedness. Look at verse number 9. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall throughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach, 
They have no delight in it. So this is talking about people that are just, and this, at the end of this chapter, it talks about reprobate silver shall man call them because the Lord hath rejected them. This is the point where people can get to where they just completely reject the word of God. It's a reproach. They have no delight in hearing God's word. Verse number 11 says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. So saying because of their just total disregard for God's word, and just it's, it's a reproach unto them, it's, um, they have zero delight in hearing God's word. They don't want to have anything to do with it. He says, therefore, I'm full of the fury of the Lord. God gets extremely angry. He's like, I can barely even contain myself from holding back. And if you think about how merciful and long-suffering God is, I mean, I know if I think about back in my life and all the sins I've committed, yet how merciful and long-suffering God has been with me personally. And if you, everyone just thinks individually in your own lives and maybe some of the things that you've gone through and sins that you've been and, and you know, committed and things that you've done, and ultimately it, it doesn't really feel like you've necessarily reaped that bad from, for what you've done. I mean, you think about, man, I've done this extreme wickedness, yet God has extended so much mercy unto me. And then to get to this point to where, you know, God is just a reproach unto you. And, and for God to be able to say, I'm weary with holding it. Like it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's really weighing on me for not bringing this judgment on you. You don't want to get anywhere close to that point with God, considering how long suffering he is. But that also explains why his fury is so, I mean, his, his wrath and his anger is so extreme. Because he holds it in for so long and just, and just will withhold and extend mercy and extend mercy and be long-suffering. But man, when you, when you get God to that breaking point, it's fire and brimstone coming down. And, and, that's, and that's a warning. And again, this is an instruction. He says, that's why he said, be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. You know, I'm growing weary of this. I'm getting sick and tired of this. You need to shape up. You need to change your ways. You need to listen to me. Because he doesn't want to do it. I mean, he, does, he doesn't want to have to do that. God's not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. I mean, it's the same way. I don't delight in, in disciplining my children. Like, I'd rather they just didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not something that's joyful. It's not something that, that you want to inflict pain on, on your child. The only reason I, would ever, I ever want to do that is just so that they can be taught and not to do it again. That's it. But you don't ever want to do it to begin with. And God's the same way, and especially when it comes to, I mean, pouring out his fury, like, he doesn't want to do it. But if you push him too far, and if things keep going, you know, get worse and worse, he's got, it's going to happen. Doubtless it'll come. It says in um, verse number 12, And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, said the Lord, for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So now he's, he's calling out the prophets and the priests, saying, look, even everyone's dealing falsely. It's not just the people, it's the pastors, it's the preachers. Look, we need to get back to the old paths, and we're going to see that here in just a second. Starting in the churches. Starting with the prophets and the, and the priests, right? Starting with the bishops, starting with, with the pastors, with the people in the churches. And that's why I'm really excited that, you know, there is sort of a movement going on now, and, 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 and it's with the younger generation, and that's what we need to reach, is that younger generation to explain, look, the ways of, of, of the, this generation is wrong. It's wickedness. We need to forsake that. We need to get back to the old paths. We need to get back to the old ways of doing things. Um, it says in verse 14, it says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And this is exactly what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Exactly what's going on today. Because here he says in verse 13, he mentions, From the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. Saying, Look, well, these, they've healed their hurt slightly by saying, Peace, peace. But the reason why it's only slightly is because there is no peace. Right? They're preaching this positive-only message. They're saying, everything's just fine. 
Everything's peaceful. Hey, the way that you're living is just fine. There's no problem with it. Yet God is up in heaven just, just ready to snap and pour out fire and brimstone on him. Yet the, the pastors, the preachers are saying, hey, hey, everything's just fine. Everything's just good. Yeah, I just got a word from the Lord. Everything's good. Mm -hmm. And he's ready to break through and just rain fire and brimstone down on people. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and, and that's what's going on today, my friends, because God's attitude towards sin has not changed. God's attitude towards wickedness has not changed one bit. God doesn't change. He's the same. Yesterday, pray, whatever. God does not change. He still views sin the same way. He still doesn't want to do that, yet you have so many of these mega churches out there just telling people how great their life is <laughs> and, and, and everything's just fine. Peace, peace. But there is no peace. And I'll tell you what, this country has gotten so wicked, God will judge this nation. Yeah. It's going to come. And it's going to come down hard. When you embrace the side of it, when you embrace such extreme, vile wickedness, and you embrace it and say everything's just fine, God is going to break forth and, 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 and set the record straight and just say, no, I am not going to put up with this. This is not acceptable. It's going to happen. Now, God is extremely long-suffering and merciful, but that point is going to come. God has that point, and it, and it comes doubtless. And um, the best we can do, because the enemy is doing so good at being deceitful and at, and at infiltrating and corrupting the minds of the youth, and that's what's going on. I mean, with, with, between the television and the music, and even the internet now, public opinion has, has shifted so much in favor of wickedness. And they've, been, they've, they've infiltrated the public schools. They've infiltrated the, you know, just every, every avenue that they can to reach these children and get them at a young age so that they can form these opinions in their mind from early on so that when they grow up, They'll think that their parents were foolish and they're going to forsake the old ways. They're going to forsake the old past because the enemy has come in while, while, while men slept and sown tares among the wheat. And, and they've gone in and infiltrated and tried to, to, to really dig into the minds of the youth. And there's so many ways that, that they're doing that. And that's why we need to get back to the old past. We need to get, get our children out of the, the, the state-run public education system where... It's not just public education, it's state education. That's state propaganda being fed. Whatever, whatever the, state, the state decides is important for your children is, is what they're going to teach. And if you think the state is a good thing, is a good place right now, look at the politicians that are, that are running the state. Okay, look at the people in charge. And look at the wickedness that is abounding in their personal lives. And you think that they're going to teach your children right? Mm -hmm. And that they're going to put policies into effect that are, going to, that are going to be for the benefit of your children? I mean, how many scandals do there have to be? It's 99% it's, it's I would say of everyone involved at the federal level in, 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 in this government. I mean, if you haven't heard about a scandal about someone, it's because it just hasn't been released yet. Mm -hmm. And, and we're talking really bad things. We're not talking about minor, you know, infractions on business deals or something they did a long time ago. We're talking about, you know, perversion. Just a lot of sexual perversion and promiscuity and, 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 just, and just people that have zero integrity whatsoever. And, um, and that, those are the people in charge of our country. And... I'm not going to have my children anywhere close to anything that those people have to do and what they're in charge of at all. And um, let's keep reading here. It says, um, verse, number, verse number 15, so right after it says, peace, peace, when there is no peace, it says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Do you think they would be, right? I mean, if you commit something abominable, when God says, look, that is an abomination, a normal person would be ashamed of doing that wrong. I mean... I know when I was a child, I got caught stealing one time, and I was like, the, oh, the first time I ever decided to try to steal something, and I got caught, I was so ashamed and embarrassed and felt so bad for me. I mean, it's some stupid thing. You know, you have, and again, in public school, I was, I, was, I was growing up in school, and all these kids, right, the cool thing was, hey, I stole this, I stole that, right? So, you, so this is the influence I'm getting. These are the kids I'm around. This is, this is what's going on. So I'm thinking, okay, well, it's 
that's that's what they're doing. I guess it's a cool thing to do. I'm gonna try it now, right? You get caught doing it, you know. You get your parents get called up. It's it's a shame. It's an embarrassment. It's something you should feel horrible about. But look at what 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 these people says. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. These people get to the point to where they don't even blush about. It. Now, I believe at first, they probably were ashamed at first, but when you continue just searing your conscience and continue just living in sin, hey, you can, you can block out any, any remorse, any type of shame, any blushing. It says, therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast out, saith the Lord. Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask, for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So he's saying, look, you need to seek the old ways. You need to seek where is the good way. The old way is the good way. And walk therein. When you hear it, when you know what the good way is, do it. Walk therein. He says, and you shall find rest for your souls. Hey, your soul will be at rest. If you're doing that which is right in God's eyes, if you're following those old paths, your soul will be at rest. You will not have the, the same turmoil and troubles within yourself, um, it, within your soul, when you're doing that which is right by God. You can lay your head down every night with a clear conscience if you're doing that which is right by God. It says in verse 17, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. So he's telling these people, he's saying, look, I've given you people to warn you, watchmen. That's what the watchmen did. They were there for a warning. He said, I've given you a watchman. They were blowing with the trumpet, you know, sounding the alarm. And again, that should be the job of the pastor, the preacher, sounding the alarm, saying, hey, look, this, you know, this is wickedness. This is sin. You need to do that which is right. Hey, God's going to come and judge you. God's going to come and bring, you know, bring judgment upon you if you don't do what he says and if you're not following that which is right. I'm going to give you the warning on that. I'm going to blow the trumpet. And God's saying, that's exactly what it is. I set watchmen over you. I gave you people to do that. You don't have an excuse. You had the warning. Your blood's going to be upon your own head. He says, he says but they said, we will not hearken. We don't want to hear that. We'd rather be preached lies. I want someone to tell me something that's just going to make me feel good. I don't want someone to tell me the truth. Verse number 18 Therefore, hear ye nations, and know, O congregation which is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. And again, we're, we're, we're in a country today, and in, in a group of people where, where God's laws are being rejected. It's being cast out. No one wants to hear it. They don't want, they don't want anything to do with it. We need to get back to the old paths. God's ways are the old ways. God's book, God's word is the old path. And it's funny because the world today is going to mock the Bible because it's so old. They're like, oh, you believe that old thing? I mean, people are even mocking the Constitution saying like, oh, that old thing? You know, like, like it's just not a big deal at all. Like, oh, yeah, well, that, that needs to be updated anyway. Hey, times are changing, you know. Uh, no, there's principles that are involved there that, that don't change. There's principles, and there's, and there's God's word. Hey, it's going to be, he, he promised that um, it's going to be around forever. So there is no old. I mean, yeah, it's old, but, but it's just as relevant today as it ever has been, if not more. Mm -hmm. That's good. People have this, and it, it comes from this pompous mindset, this pompous attitude, this proud look, this proud thought that, we're so smart these days. You know, because people in the Bible days, they were just idiots. They were like cavemen. They were just stupid, right? Well, this, is, this is the view that people have today. They, they think that like, well, we are just so educated and so smart because they have this evolution idea that, that mankind is just always getting better and evolving and, and becoming so much smarter and, and better. Everything new is just better than the old way. This is the mentality. And it's not true. I don't buy it even for a second. Now, we may have a lot of conveniences in today's world, right? There's a lot of gadgets. There's a lot of technology. There's things that we have today that weren't around before. We're able to travel faster between places. We're able to communicate with people over great distances. We're able to do certain things that, they weren't, that just wasn't around back then. 
right? This technology exists today, and, and I'm not saying any of it is good or bad. It just is, right? It's, it's, it's neutral. It's not, it's not sinful. It's not good. It's just it, it's a convenience. There's, there's things that we can do now that you weren't able to do before. But I would even question, is it really better? Is it better? Now, there's, it's convenient. It might be nice. It might, it might be enjoyable. But is it better? And I think about those conveniences we have today that, that weren't available in the past. You know, I mean, even you know, the 24-hour grocery store, right? I mean, you can get up any time of the night you want. You can go down and you can get food, you can get water, you can get, you know, whatever you want. And on the surface, hey, that doesn't seem like a bad thing. That's pretty neat. It's nice. And again, it's not sinful, right, at all. I mean, there's nothing sinful about having a 24-hour grocery store. It's a convenience. Being tied into a grid of electricity where we have all these different things. We got ceiling fans going on, we got lights, you know, um, wh whatever it is that you want to power, all these gadgets in the kitchen, refrigerators to store your food, all of these things that, that, I mean, they're great and it seems to be great, right? But with all these convenience, conveniences, has arisen a generation that is completely dependent on these things. And this is where the problem lies, is that in an entire society, I mean, people were completely dis dependent now on gadgets and things. And, um, you know, with going, to, we went to that prepper ye expo yesterday, the survivalist thing. Those things are important to know. I mean, what would happen if, you know, and then you hear about it, you talk about these solar flares or like an EMP where, I mean, everything would just be wiped out which is this whole electric grid that we're on. You know, we're dependent on these grocery stores that because it's so convenient, hey, you don't even think into the future at all. You don't do any planning. You're able to just live your life and, and just just day to day with, with zero planning and zero preparation. I mean, think about like, like nowadays, if you want to go somewhere, you know, people don't even look at maps anymore. People don't even, don't even care to know where anything is because it's just, well, I'll just put it in my iPhone, I'm going to put in the address, and it's just going to guide me there. It's going to tell me the step every, every bit of the way. Now, hey, again, there's not, I'm not saying there's anything sinful with that. Right? It's not a sin to do that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool convenience. It's a cool piece of technology that's able to do that for you. And, and, it, and it, has, it can have a use, you know. But is it really better than not having all these things? That's a question I'll leave with you. Because I, in my opinion... Even though we have all these things and we think you're so smart, I don't think that's, I don't think it's better. I think it's better to, to not be dependent on all these things and, and to be more self-sufficient and to, and, and to do more work. I mean, think about the conveniences takes away a lot of the work that you do, right? So when, when you have things like the microwave and you can just start throwing, popping in meals and, and just, um, you know, you don't have to spend the time and invest the time in doing the hard work that would be involved in actually creating a meal from scratch and you know getting the ingredients and, and using the stuff that God has given to us and doing it the way that He has designed for us. I mean, God didn't God didn't put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with a microwave and a refrigerator. <laughs> he didn't do it. That's not the way He built it, right? He didn't say, okay, well, when you're hungry, you know, throw this apple in the microwave for 30 seconds and then pull it out and eat it, or you know, whatever. I mean, it's, it's not it's not the way He designed it. Um, is it better? I don't think so. Again, and again, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything sinful. I'm not, I'm not trying to, to, to down at anyone for, for, for anything. I mean, you can look at my house. I have these devices. I have these gadgets here, right? So I'm not just saying that. But all I can say is look back and, you know, when, when I think about these people that are so lifted up in themselves and so lifted up in, in what they think is the knowledge that we have, you know, how great of a people we are, and oh, oh, how advanced we are and how smart we are. You get that one electromagnetic pulse that wipes everything out, I'm going to be questioning how smart you are and how smart we are when, when, when there's going to be multitudes of people that don't, that, that don't know how to survive because the grocery store shelves are empty and nobody is producing anything. We're just consuming and, and we're stuck with, with a bunch of useless pieces of metal that aren't going to do anything for us without any power. Um, 
again, I mean, it's is it is it better? I, I don't I don't take as much pride in, in these things as as a lot of people do. I think that God has got a lot of good ways worked out for us. And is it a lot of work? Absolutely, it is. Digging a well is hard work. <laughs> digging up those old wells is hard work. You know, and, and the reason we're digging that ditch was to put a fruit tree in. You know, I want something that's going to be able to pr produce and actually provide something for our family. And, and is it work? Sure, it's going to be work. It's going to be work maintaining. It's going to be work doing other stuff, but it's going to be providing for us, at least in some small aspect. I mean, you know, those, those little things. Um, We're in a generation now, and, and, and people are just so accustomed to it, and the old ways have just been forgotten and forsaken. I mean, people, the, the amount of farming, the amount of agriculture, just, just the, the, the livestock has, has, has diminished into the hands of a few. When you think about it, it used to be so much broader. There used to be so many more people involved in this stuff. It's diminished to so few people now. That knowledge is getting lost. And what's going to happen when, when that's all you have? You only have a few people even doing this stuff. I don't know. Um, anyways, um, okay. that stuff isn't all that spiritual. It's just more practical, right? But spiritually, we definitely need to get back to the old ways. Newer is not better. The new way of worshiping God, bringing in the rock concerts, bringing in, you know, whatever, that, that, that's not better. At all. We need to go back to the old ways. We need, to, we need to make sure that the way that we worship God, the way that we speak to God, the way that we serve God, is all the ways that He has laid out for us in the Bible to a T. And, and not change it, not alter it, because if we think we can do have a better idea than what God's already given us, you're fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. Your ways are not better than God's ways. Your adaptations to what God has said and what God has told us to do are not any better at all. If it was better, God would have told you so. Okay? We need to just make sure that we have the faith to trust Him at His Word. We need to, and again, it's important for us as Baptists today to reject all that type of modernism that's creeping in. And, um, you know, those old wells have been filled in. We need to dig them back up again. We need to dig up these old wells. And it's going to require a lot of hard work. But let's start doing it the right way. God will bless you for doing it the right way. If you, you know, let's do it. It may take some time. You're not going to see the results overnight. You need to prepare yourselves, get in this book, and know what God has said for you to do. And then start doing it. You know, love church, love hearing his word, and love doing it. And you know what? This church, we're still very small. We've been around for about seven months. But I have faith that God will bless us. But we need to keep doing things His way. I mean, if you get too distracted and think, man, you know, we're not growing. I want things to grow faster. I, want, I, want, I just want to have it now and just have that mentality. I could change the music. We could change, you know, the way we do things. I could tone down the preaching and only preach positive messages. Maybe we'll start getting a lot more people. We probably will. But we're not going to do that. God's not going to bless that. And then what's the point? It's just... It's, it's worthless. Then we'll just be like every other church that's, that's out there. Um, let's put in the hard work. And, let's, and you know what? We know what's going to make it grow faster is when everyone pitches in. I'm so thankful that to have Brother Jerry helping me dig that ditch because if I was doing that all by myself, that would have taken at least twice as long. Now, Jerry's better at digging, show, digging ditches for some reason, and I've only got more experience, but <laughs> it probably would have taken me three times as long to do it by myself because he was probably working twice as much as I was on it, just, just getting more stuff done. But um, having that help is a great thing. And, and the more we as a church can, can pitch in, pick up a shovel, we'll get these wells dug, and we'll get them producing. We'll get that, that water flowing. We'll get, we'll, we'll reach so many more people when everybody is pitching in and everybody is trying to do their part and, and, and getting their hands dirty and doing the work and, and literally rolling up your sleeves and going out and preaching the gospel and, and, and just studying God's word so that, that you can be that, that fountain of truth and, um, and just, just be a minister and people help people. Let's bow our heads and we're praying. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word, dear God. I pray that you please help us never to forsake the old ways, the ways that you've given to us. Your ways are the right ways, dear Lord. Your way is the good way. And I pray that you please just help us to know your word.
so that we can even know what the good way is. Help us to study and to meditate, dear Lord. Teach us, increase our wisdom, increase our knowledge, dear Lord. Give us the understanding that we need. Help us to remain vigilant in an ever-changing world. Help us to stay tied to that rock, to the rock of Jesus Christ, dear Lord. Help us to, to stay close to you and to your ways and not to be, be shifted in, the, in the, the shifting sands of this world, dear Lord, but that we would um, just follow you and obey you and, and be your servants, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.